the hour of 3 o'clock having arrived and the council having finished its business in closed session, we are now in regular session. The clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom is absent. Councilmember Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Calentari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. We are on the second item on our agenda. This is a proclamation declaring August 22nd as Downtown Ambassadors Day, and I would like to invite Councilmember Calentari Johnson to make a presentation of the proclamation. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Ambassadors, for being here. So I serve on the Downtown Management Corporation Board. Yes, please step up. And when I heard the report of what you all have been doing over this last summer, I was so impressed. So I asked that our mayor um, do this proclamation, and he's given me the opportunity to present it to you. So I'm going to read it, and then um, I'll give you a moment to comment, and I'll come and give this to you. All right. Whereas downtown ambassadors work seven days a week to support a positive experience for visitors, employees, residents, and others spending time in the downtown district, and whereas downtown ambassadors are friendly on-street concierge for the downtown community and address quality of life issues and provide assistance for those in need. And whereas downtown ambassadors are funded through an assessment of properties in Front Street, Cedar Street, Pacific Avenue, and Side Streets, one block in either direction between Laurel Street and Water Street, that is funded by the Downtown Management Corporation, and whereas downtown ambassadors, whose mission is to make public spaces friendly and vibrant for the communities they serve, are managed by the Downtown Association of Santa Cruz, are an extension of the businesses in the downtown district. And whereas downtown ambassadors work closely with the many agencies who support the downtown district and are both a valuable link for the business community and a welcoming face for visitors by expending, extending the customer service of businesses out onto the sidewalks. And, whereas, in a nutshell, downtown ambassadors provide services for anything a city and downtown district needs to be a more desired destination, cleaning, safety, beautification, and hospitality. Now, therefore, on behalf of Fred Keeley, Mayor of Santa Cruz um, City Council, we hereby proclaim August 22nd, 2023, as Downtown Ambassadors Day in the City of Santa Cruz, and encourage all citizens to join us in expressing heartfelt appreciation to the Downtown Ambassadors team for their hard work and dedication to help create a safe, clean, and welcoming environment for everyone who lives, works in, or visits downtown Santa Cruz. Thank you so much for all that you do. And I will come up and give this to you and see if you have any words. Good afternoon. Feel free to make Good some afternoon. remarks. Um, my name is Alicia, and I am the team lead for the Downtown Santa Cruz Ambassador Team. And we just want to say that we are honored to receive this mayoral proclamation. And thank you for the recognition. God love you all. Thank you. <laughs> my name is Ismael. Thank you for everything. Certainly. Thank you, sir. My name is Hacho, and I appreciate you, everything you do. Thank you, sir. My name is Ambassador Cody, and I just want to say that it's our privilege and pleasure to uh, help make uh, downtown in Santa Cruz look better and brighter for all of us. So thank, thank you, you. Ambassador. Thank you. I'm uh, Jorian Wilkins, and I'm with the Downtown Association of Santa Cruz. And on behalf of the over 500 businesses downtown, we want to say how much we appreciate your daily support, what an enormous difference you make in the clean, safe, and welcoming experience that we all enjoy because you're there every day, because you handle all the things that come up, all the surprises, all the things the rest of us don't know what to do. You guys handle with an incredible amount of flexibility, grace, and compassion every day, and we're just so proud to have you be part of our team. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Now, here's the good news. You don't have to stay for this meeting. <laughs> nice <to see> you. <laughs> Presiding officer announcements have none. Statement of disqualification. Any member need to disqualify themselves on a vote? Seeing and hearing none. Additions or deletions. Do we have additions or deletions to the agenda? We have none. We have none. City attorney report from closed session. Sure. Uh, the council met in closed session with its legal counsel to discuss three liability claims, the claim of Carrie McCormick, the claim of Nancy Ogle, and the claim of AFNI. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Madam City Clerk, any uh, items you need to brought, draw to our attention on the calendar? No, no. Very good. Thank you. We are on the consent agenda. For those of you unfamiliar with it, we will take up on a single vote items 4 through 16 inclusive. Uh, we will take all of those on one vote. What we will do is give the opportunity to council members and members of the public to pull an item off of that consent agenda for further discussion uh, or comment or question. Let me start with the city council. Let me ask if members have questions on, and I will start with Ms. Bruner. Ms. Bruner. None. Ms. Valentari Johnson. 14. 14. What would you like to do on that one? Uh, so this is the Westcliff Drive, uh -huh. Bethany Curve Culvert. I just want to first acknowledge staff for continuing your work on this. And I'm wondering if since the writing of this um, agenda, if there's been any updates on how it's going with the contractor and getting that bid going. Good afternoon, sir. Afternoon, Kevin Crossley, city engineer. Um, so update on the infill walls. We have our first bid expected tomorrow from Granite Construction. We received a draft schedule from them that we're reviewing. So things are progressing on that front. And our hope is to get this package out to bid as soon as possible to start generating interest in this second phase of work. Thank you. Further questions on that? Thank you so much. Other items? Ms. Collintari Johnson? The vice mayor is recognized. I just wanted to comment on item 14 and a comment on another one but I'll start with 14 um, and I just wanted to thank the staff for the tremendous work that's gone into making this happen I know it's a, a huge undertaking and collaboration with multiple agencies and the community so I just want to thank and acknowledge all the work that they've put in that's mm -hmm. gone above and beyond and then a comment on number nine um, and Eight is that I'm super glad to see those apparatuses being replaced and uh, in a way that's um, keeping up with the demand. So thank you for making that happen, everybody. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Councilmember Watkins is recognized. Councilmember Brown is recognized. Very good. On uh, one item. Make sure I get the right item here. If the clerk could, when we get around to voting on this, if you would record me as abstaining on item six in so far as I did not attend the meeting, I was unable to be here. So I won't be voting on the minutes of that meeting. This is the opportunity for anyone who is with us who wishes to make a comment on an item on our consent agenda or request that it be pulled, you can tee up right over here. Ms. Matthews, as usual, welcome to the council Hello chambers. Hello, friends. Um, I wanted to comment very briefly on item 12, which is the downtown recovery authorization. Um, it's hard to imagine. It's been 30 years since the mall was built. I mean, <laughs> the time does fly. And it also is a good time for an overall refresh. And so this... Uh, a very timely uh, project. I'm delighted to see that you're doing it. Um, and the city also is doing so much mo more than just these capital improvements, the ongoing graffiti removal, the litter cleanup, the sidewalk cleaning, and so forth. And there are a whole lot of players, as you know. It's so appropriate that you acknowledge the, the ambassadors just now. The city departments, the DTA, the DMC, individual businesses and organizations. And I want to thank you for appointing me to the downtown commission earlier this year. <laughs> Um, I will put on the agenda for the downtown commission that we do an in-detail de look at the, the downtown parking district facilities and see how they can, uh, what they can do as well to support the effort that's before us. Um, I think 
in addition to all that's happening here, there are some ongoing uh, issues that kind of don't fall into anyone's department, and they tend to be what might seem kind of minor maintenance thing, but the weeds in the tree wells and um, pruning the trees so that they don't hit you in the face when you walk down the street, little things like that. They're not critical. They're not a capital improvement, but they do contribute to the overall feeling of someone's really caring about the place. So um, I do acknowledge the limits of budget and staff, and these things are hard to fund on an ongoing basis, but um, it's something you all know this. You've heard my, <laughs> my speech before, but um, I am interested in being part of the overall effort. It was, certainly we're poised to make a big difference and, and a, big, a big leap for downtown. So thank you very much. Thank you for all you do for our city. Good afternoon. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Rachel Sotos. I'm a homeowner on the west side of Santa Cruz. I'd like to bring forth number six on the consent agenda. Um, I've lived in Santa Cruz County over my life many times. I went to nursery school here at Red Bell, lived in Ben Loman, Boulder, in Boulder Creek, in Santa Cruz, many places. I, um, I have a special place in my heart for the west side because when I was a freshman in high school in Palo Alto, I won most likely to be found on Beach Street in Santa Cruz on a school day. So I take it very, very seriously. I may have bought some nickel bags in the beach flats before it was legal. Um, I, I was able to review um, some of the uh, last meeting from last week, last week, the special study session, and I'm so delighted that there's such serious work undertaken to uh, restore and take into account the many community needs for the reconstruction. But as I reviewed for what I could tell from the Fairlawn Agency uh, report, it seemed like there might be some fine print that we want to go into. And in the, in the uh, report, there is the list of the agencies. And it would make sense that the Army Corps of e Engineers and FEMA would be there. But there's also the silver jackets. And I just you know, spent an hour or two looking up online, following the various links. And uh, the, that's basically uh, 25 agencies under the auspices of the Department of Defense. So it's the Army, the military, the Navy, the NSA intelligence, geospatial logistics, media threat reduction, and a lot of health agencies, health, military health agencies. Um, that brings us to uh, an item on the bottom of their um, website, uh, which is uh, usace.mil.silverjackets, about silver jackets. And that's the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. And they have a PDF that's available on Google. It's the Research Strategic Plan. And this is uh, interesting to me as an alumni of UC Santa Cruz because I know that UC Santa Cruz is now in process of transforming Santa Cruz into a global community health mecca in a way. And, and I just want to, I want to suggest that there might be a discrepancy between the construction that is going to happen on the west side and the 50-year plan, which invites many military agencies to be involved. And the thing that's most concerning to me is that there are so many lists of m military medical research in turning partnership with academic and military labs, drug discovery, social and behavioral research, population health research, health policy, military women's health, radiobiology and nuclear related research, military health and readiness challenges, discovery of cutting edge research alignment. And it, it just seems like maybe there's some fine print we need to look into and understand what is, is possibly happening. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, sir. good afternoon. Those are some excellent notes. Uh, the previous speaker said there's a lot going on that's not being talked about. You do a little bit of research and you open it up and, wow, that branches into 50 different people. So on the consent agenda, maybe I'll end with the consent agenda number four, which is extend the storm emergency. You know, I think it's fabulous that the city is buying two more ambulances. Thank goodness they're diesel, you know, until uh, magnetic fuelless motors become mainstream and diesel DC electric becomes more mainstream. It's the way to go. You know, the, that's, what is it, 455000 for two vehicles? So the city's getting another 107-foot, um, I don't know when I wrote, but it's tractor-driven for one, about $1.8 I think that's great. You know, my understanding, reading 
into that is that the, due to EPA standards, they're buying another one. You know, um, fire trucks have like triple reduction on them. You know, that's uh, diesels are great. You warm it up and you run it like you stole it. So uh, at least with fire trucks, there's red lights and sirens. Um, you're getting two for six hundred ninety thousand a, a side loader to, uh, garbage truck and then a uh, off road off road off roll off for about seven hundred thousand. That's a great investment. I'm assuming those are diesel. Um, so back to the extended storm. You know, I spoke uh, in the county council earlier. Someone made note of. Uh, the tragedy that happened in uh, Maui. Hey, my timer says three minutes. That You're can't doing fine. be right. You're doing fine. Okay, I'll give myself 30 seconds. So, I mean, I did have a really fun, jovial conversation with Sheriff Jim Hart. I mean, we communicate on a fair basis. Uh, I have a much greater understanding for how difficult his job is and other sheriff jobs are because they're being controlled by international organizations. But back to the, the extending the storm, um, a lot of people talk about climate change. I mean, it's really climate terrorism. Um, there's, I had, was a direct witness to the directed energy weapons fire three years ago. I have tons of photographs of that, including where I used to live that got turned into foundry ash. I mean, you look at 9-11, you look at the fires all over the place that are all part of other agendas. And so, um, when you look at the flooding in Hurricane Hillary over the weekend, What's happened to our food supply? Because my understanding is there's thousands of fires going on on the planet right now and over 360 just in British Columbia. But I'm gonna directly say those are frequency weapons. So that's enough for now because there's a ton of information on that. It's a good thing I backed up my stuff because boy, have I been censored. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. For the public comment, anyone online, Ms. Bush? Wishes to comment on the consent agenda? No one with their hand raised, no. Okay. Matters back before the council. A motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll move the consent. I'll move the consent. Nope. Okay. There's a motion okay. by, by council member Watkins and a second by the vice mayor to approve the council, uh, excuse me, to approve the consent agenda items four through 16 inclusive with the note that I will be recorded as not voting on item six. Clerk will call the roll. Council member Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Palantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We are on item 17. This is the Regional Early Action Plan 2.0 Regional Funding Grant Application. Uh, Mr. Van Waugh or Mr. Butler, will you be presenting on this, sir, if needed? Okay. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Lee Butler, Planning Director uh, for Planning and Community Development for the City. And um, Matt will be doing the presentation. I will... Um, give a brief introduction um, as it relates to the REAP 2.0 grant. Um, you saw at your last meeting, we applied for the um, guaranteed portion, which is $180,000 um, that will be um, applying towards our library affordable housing project in the downtown. And um, this application is uh, a competitive grant process and uh, the minimum request is 500,000. As Matt will discuss, we are uh, proposing to um, request a $750,000 grant to go towards um, the project that will meet the objectives identified, which are um, affirmatively furthering fair housing, um, promoting housing production, and uh, reducing vehicle miles traveled. And so we're looking at um, doing um, objective standards within our single family zoning districts, something that um, moves us beyond what we currently have with the allowances under SB9, which already allows for residential units on single family properties um, throughout the state. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Matt and he can uh, talk about what we're proposing here. Mr. Van Waugh, good afternoon, sir. Hey, good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor and Council. Can you hear me okay? 
Great. We're here to talk about the Regional Early Action Plan uh, 2.0 grant for inclusive infill housing. Um, what's not being shared? Did I share it from here? Sorry. Through the Zoom webinar. Okay, great. Thanks. For our agenda today, we're going to talk about the REAP 2.0 grant, uh, planning context, and then affirmatively furthering fair housing, and then talking about our, uh, our proposal itself in, in inclusive infill and missing middle housing, and then uh, briefly next steps. So the, Re the REAP 2.0 grant, as, uh, as Lee mentioned, it stands for Regional Early Action Planning. Uh, grant it's the, the second of the two programs the first one was came out a few years ago so this is the 2.0 uh, version and it's administered by the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments AMBAG and they have three main goals in this grant and those are to accelerate infill housing supply choice and affordability affirmatively furthering fair housing uh, which you'll sometimes see as AFFH uh, throughout the presentation and then uh, reducing vehicle miles traveled, the BMT. And as Lee mentioned too, it's a, it's a competitive grant. Uh, there's about $6 million total available, and uh, they're looking for applications above 500,000. So we've chosen to apply for 750,000 for this, this uh, project. So just to give you some, some background on, on kind of why we Thought this was this proposal was a good idea and, and some things aligned to to make it a, a, a potentially really beneficial for the city uh, in the last few years we did our objective standards process uh, and that was focused on multifamily development housing development and uh, there's now a real opportunity to do additional objective standard work for uh, single-family zoning which still encompasses you know about 50 percent of our city and as we've seen, um, you know, uh, um, in terms of uh, in the single family area, you know, we have mostly large houses that are being built now. Uh, you know, there's teardowns and then there's new development. We see a lot of large house applications and uh, we would like more objective standards for those to, to streamline that development better and also to provide more, uh, uh, more, uh, 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 outcomes that everyone is uh, is aware of ahead of time. Sorry, thanks. And we also have a, a lot of a uh, substandard size lots that we're trying to deal with and figuring out better ways to put housing on them as well. Um, and then in the last five years or so, we've also seen a lot of legislation around accessory dwelling units or ADUs, and we're seeing a lot more of those being built in the city. And those combined with uh, Senate Bill 9 uh, which was passed in 2021 and uh, went into effect in January 2022, that allows for two units uh, on any single family lot and, uh, and it allows any uh, single family lot to lot split. And so a, project, uh, a single family lot can now have four units um, and anywhere that, it, that uh, qualifies for SB9 if it, if it combines these units with ADUs as well. So we're looking at more standards around how those two are combined, SB9 and ADUs. And then one final thing as well, uh, Senate Bill 10 was also passed on the same day as Senate Bill 9. And Senate Bill 10 is something that the state uh, allows cities to choose to upzone. It's not a requirement, but the state is, is granting cities uh, the opportunity to upzone properties near transit without triggering CEQA. And that's up to 10 units. Per parcel so that is another opportunity that the city could potentially take advantage of through this process so for some additional uh, planning context as well uh, talk a bit about fair housing issues uh, as these relate to uh, especially to affirmatively furthering fair housing so there there's a significant history uh, of zoning for segregation it was actually allowed in government code until 1917 
and then informally uh, through a number of ways through redlining and other types of discrimination uh, for quite a while through the mid uh, 1900s as well and uh, uh, so since since the mid 1900s we did see racial integration declining uh, or sorry it was declining until the nine the mid 1900s and has been somewhat improving since then uh, but economic segregation has actually increased since the 1970s so we're still seeing significant disparity uh, throughout our land use patterns today uh, and th those really play out geographically as, as you'll see uh, the state's uh, housing and uh, community development department as a uh, opportunity areas where they have looked at a number of economic education and health outcomes and have mapped those geographically uh, throughout the state and what you'll really what you'll see on the right here are the these HCD opportunity areas in the city the blue areas are the areas of, of uh, high opportunity and the gray areas are the area of, uh, of moderate opportunity and you'll see these uh, overlap quite substantially with single family zoning as these areas of higher opportunity. And so it's a really important thing to consider, you know, are there ways to add more housing uh, in these areas of higher opportunity to support AFFH goals? And right here, the, the state has also recently passed a legislation focusing more attention on affirmatively furthering fair housing uh, and Assembly Bill 686 was uh, adopted in 2018, and it defines affirmatively furthering fair housing as taking meaningful actions in addition to combating discrimination that overcome patterns of segregation and foster inclusive communities free from barriers that restrict access to opportunity based on protected characteristics. The duty to affirmatively further fair housing extends to all of a public agency's activities and programs related to housing and community development. So we see, we see a real opportunity there to, to really uh, affirmatively further fair housing through a, 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 a looking more closely at our single family housing areas and figuring out ways to create more flexibility and affordability in those areas. And so with that, I, I wanted to talk also about our, our overall idea for this as well. It, um, in addition to the AFFH goals, what this is also meeting is missing middle housing goals. And so missing middle housing is, is a fairly recent term and it refers to, to two things. So historically, cities have, have long had a variety of housing types in their, in their residential neighborhoods. Uh, if you look at, you know, the areas around downtown Santa Cruz, for instance, you see a, quite a mix of, of housing types from single family to, to smaller multifamily projects or single, large single family Victorian houses that eventually became several units. Uh, and it, it's, it's a, a substantial variety of housing that really allows for a lot of, uh, a variety of uh, incomes and uh, naturally affordable housing. And as that suburbanization and segregation process happened in the 1900s and single family zoning spread out, that it became just single family zoning as a detached housing type in many neighborhoods and stopped allowing for this variety of housing that created more natural affordability and inclusion mm -hmm. in the city. So this missing middle is, is essentially uh, most cities and Santa Cruz largely included uh, have a lot of detached single family housing and then they have larger multifamily housing that we know of, but very few of these more uh, uh, inclusive, smaller scale multifamily projects, four units, things like that, that fit into neighborhoods in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, a way that's, that's inclusive and, uh, and fits into the context of the neighborhood itself. Uh, it's compatible, that's the word I was looking for. And then there's also the, the cost opportunities or the, the opportunity for the cost of these projects as well. Uh, I kind of referred to that a little bit in terms of the, uh, the affordability of these projects. Uh, so many cities see single family houses and then there's larger multifamily projects and there's just a very large cost difference there and we don't see 
uh, a lot of opportunities for people in between that, which is really common moderate income, workforce, housing kind of incomes. Um, there, there's just not enough of those. So missing middle housing, finding ways to have these smaller projects uh, in more parts of the city uh, tackles both uh, increasing density in these areas of higher opportunity, but also adding to a, a, a variety and, and adding uh, more potential for affordability of homes and uh, chances to uh, age in place or, or add units to a, a lot uh, to have siblings or children, <laughs> things like that live in the, in their, uh, in the lot as it. well. And what we've seen, uh, there's a, a few cities right now doing this. Uh, Portland adopted their residential infill project a couple years ago. And in 2022, they released a one-year study on, on this process uh, that would be very similar to ours. Uh, and it, it was an astounding success. They've added hundreds of units in just the first year that this was adopted. Larger city, of course, but it's something that definitely took off uh, and was popular and, and is adding housing in the right way, in the right places in that city. Uh, Minneapolis, as well, has been in the news recently for their housing work. Uh, they adopted this as well. Um, and uh, Berkeley more recently adopted one just, just this year, uh, a missing middle uh, program similar to this. And uh, Sacramento is currently undergoing this as well. Um, and they're in the process right now. So it is something out there and it, it, there are cities we can draw a lot of best practices from in this work as well. Kind of speaking about Portland a little bit, not only did Portland allow for things like fourplexes, but they also provided an opportunity for people to add additional units, kind of in a density bonus kind of way. If, if you added two more affordable units, you could have six units on a property instead of four, for instance. Um, and that's something the city could certainly explore as well. And, and the way to do that would be uh, combining that, that affordability with SB 10 and uh, saying that properties that are close to high quality transit that meet the SB 10 requirements uh, and choose to provide more affordability on the site could be allowed to have additional units on the site, for instance. So that's, that's also something that we could explore through this process to both uh, add, add more units closer to transit, which accomplishes a lot of VMT goals, uh, but then also adds, of course, more affordability to the project as well and provides more affordable housing in the city. So the inclusive infill project scope, what we're looking to do with this project is uh, create additional objective standards for single family housing and duplexes. Uh, create new objective standards for SB9 combined with accessory dwelling units, uh, allow for new triplexes and fourplexes, and, and figuring out ways through those objective standards to make them more compatible with neighborhoods, and then uh, new objective standards for affordable SB10 units beyond, beyond four unit projects. And then also we, we heard from uh, Yimby. Uh, they commented, uh, provided a comment letter a couple days ago and spoke about uh, economic feasibility analysis for this as well, uh, which, which we agreed with, and we would like to add that to our scope as well. So we would be doing economic feasibility analysis as well. So just quickly, uh, the project goals for this would be to address existing neighborhood compatibility concerns around single family houses currently and their objective standards uh, that we would like more of, uh, as well as SB9 standards and then uh, provide for a greater variety of housing and improve affordability, and then support more inclusion and equity throughout Santa Cruz. So next steps, uh, council approves the resolution for us to apply for the grant. We would be applying for that. Uh, it's due next week on the 31st, and then we would receive a notification by November of that decision, uh, followed by grant execution by February of next year and then the project would have to be complete by March 2026. So we soon, soon after the grant execution, we would be getting a consultant on board and working on it over the next couple of years. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Let me ask if there are questions or comments by members of the Council. Council, the Vice Mayor is recognized. 
I don't have somebody else go first. I have so many that maybe someone else will ask them on mine. Okay. All right. Take your time. Okay. We're good. Okay. So um, yeah. good. thank you for applying for this. I really do like the idea of having some um, some objective standards for single family residences. I think that's really important. Um, I have a question because I've been to Portland and Berkeley. I haven't been to Minneapolis, but I don't think they're anything like Santa Cruz and they're much bigger. And I'm wondering if there's have you looked at other cities that have like a more small city look and feel? I don't think that the majority of the residents of Santa Cruz would want our city to turn into Portland or Berkeley or the other ones. And that's my first question. My yeah, uh, I don't know. Speaking to Portland specifically, while, while there was a large increase in units, I mean, it's 200, I can't remember the exact number, but it's about 250 units, I think sprinkled over a city you know, probably 20 times our size, something like that. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a very incremental change. It's actually not something you're going to see full-scale adoption of immediately. You know, think of like SB9 as well. You know, we, that passed a few years ago, and we're just starting to see a few projects here and there come in, which is great. Uh, the way we, we think of this project is it's similar. Like we're going to allow for a few more options and a, few more, and a little more flexibility but it's not going to be a, a large scale change. We, we expect it to be a very incremental. And even if we're just adding a, a couple units a year over time, that would really compound and, and, and uh, you know, not, not change the character, feel of neighborhoods, but add units where uh, they can be really beneficial. Thank you. I appreciate that. And so I did thought I heard 10 units on a single family lot. So could that be on, I know there's some substandard lots on the west side that are less than 5,000 square feet, 10 units? Yeah, so S SB 10 uh, allows a city to upzone up to 10 units, but any city can choose a number less than that. So we currently allow, SB 9 allows for four units on any uh, single family site right now. Regardless if it's standard or... Correct. Yeah. So Portland, for instance, allowed six units if two units were affordable. So something like that, you know, there, there's a different, you know, there's a lot of different options. We, maybe we only allow one more unit or two, or, you know, there's a lot of ways to explore, yeah. explore that. And, you know, we, we would have to go through that process with this project, but. Uh, I think, I hope that there'll be more community engagement yeah. throughout the process if we, and I hope we go through the process with or without the grant, because I think there's a lot of people that aren't in the room that would have a, a many things to say about this. Because um, I guess another, another thing that I, I hope gets brought up throughout the process would be some of the missing middle class. I didn't see like mobile home parks or condos or townhouses specifically on there. And I think those are also opportunities for affordable housing where people have more of a pathway to middle class, like to home ownership, and maybe first time home buyers or people that are, uh, you know, downsizing, those are, that, then that creates opportunities um, for people that are, you know, moving around. And, and I didn't see those on there. And recently I talked to a developer downtown, and he was saying that developers kind of shy away from condos and townhouses at this point because of these lawyers that are in, in the state, sorry, Cassie, but I, I don't know how to describe them. I don't want this offensive to lawyers, but ambulance chaser type lawyers that go around at nine and a half years and sue condo developers um, and basically bankrupt them. And so that's why they'd rather build apartments. And so I think the more we're building just apartments and especially 100% affordable apartments, the more we're going to continue to see social segregation because that's, you know, who's going to live there but people that can qualify to live in those um, those units and so to me it's really a huge bummer and a missed opportunity to not have more of that kind of housing and so I don't know if that's something that the, the department can explore and um, yeah that was that's kind of a question is that something that we can explore as an opportunity area also yeah I think we, we can definitely look at rent rental and ownership for, for these projects we've done a lot of rentals in the last since my time on council and I haven't seen a lot of opportunities for home ownership mm. um and, and one more thing too sorry if yeah, I smear, you, you mentioned uh, uh you brought up uh, community engagement as well which is yeah. which is really important i forgot to mention in the presentation 
the fact that uh, you know this really gives us a chance to look more closely at uh, things like SB9 stuff that was you know essentially just uh, uh, given to us by the state and we didn't okay. have this community process around yeah. it and you know we're, we're able to look more closely at SB9 and work with the community uh, through this process to come up with uh, you know more of a community driven uh, uh, standards around SB9 and, and other types of housing that we'd like to explore in this process. Thank you. And I guess just my last question is, as these developments go up, I know a lot of us have roof rooftop solar. If someone put in a fourplex next door to me or a tenplex next door to me, that would essentially eliminate my ability to produce electricity, make me reliant on our friends at Central Coast Energy and uh, PG&E completely. And so when you're thinking about that, I hope that that's something that we consider in our objective design work. And, yeah. and I just think like those of us that have made the sacrifice to buy a home or worked really hard to rent a home or buy a home because we wanted to live in a neighborhood with that kind of feel and have that kind of space, um, I, would ha I know it'd be incremental, but I would hate to see the decisions we're making here completely destroy what the, what the city looks like 30 years from now. I was mentioning we had we went to Belize uh, a few Christmases ago, and that's essentially what happened on one of the islands. There's people were buying up lots and then developing, and it just turned into you know something completely different. The other thing I think, if there's any opportunity at the state level and federal level to advocate for, and I know this is going to sound maybe people are going to think this sounds horrible, but I think what also drives up the cost of housing in this state, particular in particular, is foreign investors. Um, I know New Zealand and I think maybe Vancouver, they stopped letting people from China or overseas that come in with huge bags of money buy up and turn houses into rental rental houses or whatever, redevelop the, them. Because when I'm listening to this presentation, I'm thinking, yes, it will create more housing, but will it be affordable? I don't think so. The only people that are going to make any money off this is going to be the developers. Like, will my kids be able to buy something or will her kids or, the, you know, will we be able to stay in town I don't know what I see as developers making a lot of money, and I don't know. I, have, you know, my theories about the SB9. I think they're well intended, but I think that the that the lobbyists um, kind of, I don't know, brought us to this point. So that's my rant. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Brown is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Van Wa. I'll, let's see, I'll start out just by saying I, I agree with the vice mayor's comments uh, about the appetite in our community for um, this level of high density development and bringing density into neighborhoods. So I do think we need to pr proceed with caution. Um, and this is something I've talked about, it's probably no surprise since you've heard me talking about this for the past seven years <laughs> at this dais. Um, but I, I do think that that community engagement piece um, is is so critical, and you know the forgot. And I, with all due respect, I, I, I say this, um, Mr. Yan, why you said, well, I, I forgot to mention the community engagement piece. It, I think it needs to absolutely be front and center, um, and not uh, kind of an afterthought. Or, you know, it really has to. You know, if, if we get if we move forward and get this money, um, it just feels like that is. Um, it's in our interest uh, for um, for the good of our community and and also for uh, the the city itself in the work we do, um, and so I I just want to have and I I do have a question and it may sound like I'm um, being uh, uh, d defensive or you know um, I, I don't mean this to I hope you take it in the spirit uh, that it's it's offered. Um, so you've mentioned in the report and the planning department is committed to uh, trying to address this, you know, bigger history of, of discrimination and segregation in, in housing. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm curious as to how the goals that the city holds for moving through um, the infill housing policy and zoning process um, will be an be an antidote to that to that history, um, it and and how um, the you know given the current hyperinflation of housing costs for renters and um, people who are trying to purchase a home here, um, just you know off the charts inaccessible for everybody um, or almost everybody. Um, how like 
how is this going to actually get us more affordable housing? I see the t words, um, affordability, inclusion, equity, sprinkled through this report, and you've mentioned it, and I don't doubt that those are shared values among all of us, um, but I don't see any, um, I've yet to see any evidence in this report or kind of otherwise in these broader conversations that um, this kind of infill will actually create affordable housing for us. There is no requirement for that, with the exception possibly of, you know, if we do want to up zone near transit and really go for up to 10 <laughs> units on, a, on any single family lot, there might be a couple of units required. One, if, if we use our current standards, um, possibly more if we want to go bigger. Um, but that's a very small portion. So how, how um, and I'll just say one more thing, as we, um, as the, the demographics in our community and the median um, income continue to rise as a result of what kind of housing gets built and who is attracted to our community, the, um, those numbers go up. And so to qualify for uh, affordable housing units, the very few that we may get um, in this process it is uh, very going to be very difficult. So, um, just given all of that, those challenges, how do you, how do you see like what evidence do we have that we're going to get affordable housing? Um, because I don't think we should be asserting that if that's not what's going to happen. What's really going on? Thanks. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. Uh I would, I would first say two things. So there, the one is that there is an opportunity through this process to explore that SB9 approach where we get actual deed-restricted affordable housing through this process. Uh, but the other way, if, if we're not doing that and we're still doing just a fourplex, for instance, in a single-family zone, there is a more natural affordability in that in that project. Uh, they are they are smaller units. And they're typically projects that don't have the same level of amenities that a larger, uh, you know, apartment building with a pool and lobby and everything have. So they they are typically more affordable than even your average apartment building unit uh, in the city. So those are those are two ways. Um, also mentioned too, uh, Minneapolis. If if you uh, look up, it, it was in the news recently. Minneapolis's housing programs uh, were in the news because Minneapolis had the lowest housing inflation in the entire nation uh, this past year. Um, partially could be due to the this, their missing middle program, could also be due to their larger housing production in general. Uh, I'd have to look more into that. Uh, but certainly, you know, in one case study has definitely shown that uh, these type of units have improved uh, housing inflation quite a bit uh, for this one city. And it is one of only four cities that do have this, uh, this missing middle program. So that, that was really exciting news. Mr. Butler. Thanks, Matt, and thank you, Mayor. Um, a, a couple of additional points related to that. Um, I can say that the Minneapolis mayor, for example, did attribute that lowest level of inflation in the country to um, both um, the fact that their housing did not have the same uh, price increases and he um, contributed that to the increase in supply. I think an increase in supply is not a panacea. We need to do other things. We need to provide various protections like we have with the um, uh, relocation assistance. But um, absent increased supply, we know that prices will increase and that they will increase faster than if we don't provide that supply. And so there are a lot of studies that speak to both the need for that increased supply and also the housing filtering effect that occurs when additional housing is provided and how that opens up other opportunities for people in the community to move um, within the area and not just from outside of the area. And so that's, that's one of the uh, other criticisms that we often hear is, oh, when we're building new housing, it's just going to bring in people from elsewhere. And that does happen, but the majority of that, the studies show that the majority of that housing and the filtering uh, that occur happens as people move out of housing to move into that happens at a local level. So all of that contributes. And, and when we talk about the affirmatively furthering fair housing, when we look at those single family neighborhoods, aside from ADUs, there aren't many options for relatively affordable units. 
And so this would provide through um, an additional approach, a, a different approach to SB9, um, a compatible approach with SB9, um, options for um, units that aren't just the single family or aren't just the ADU. And so then that can then offer opportunities for more families to, to move into those areas of high opportunity with good schools, with uh, good parks, and so forth. Can I just quick follow up? Appreciate the, the, the supply and demand theory, and I've read some of those studies. Um, I know there are some variations. We could, we could talk about that offline. Thanks, um, Mr. Butler. Um, just a, a quick question that I would ask, though, is um, how, so can you remind us, what, whoever may have, have this available or if not could get it quickly, um, when we say, for example, ADUs are relatively more affordable, what's, I know we've had kind of different reports suggesting they're in the affordability category. No, they're not. Um, it's mostly anecdotal. I know the city and I commend you, the staff, for really trying to get a handle on that through the surveys. Um, but what's just less, more affordable than the new units with the amenities? What's the uh, sort of a ballpark for an ADU? I can only speak to our, our most recent ADU survey. Just, uh, yeah, I, which, I can't remember what it was, but if you could remind which us. Was, which was voluntary. But based on the based on what we received back, uh, it was 89% of the ADUs we received uh, would have qualified for a low income. Okay, so for the of the those who responded to the survey, okay. correct. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. For the questions, Council Member, I think we might have Mr. a little Butler. more. Sure. I I would just add um, that that contributing to that. Uh, because you know, I think it's an important component is that ADUs are oftentimes lim uh, rented to family members or friends, um, and so um, that does it, it. Still offers a level of affordability, but it, it also is just another lens by which to understand why some of those numbers are low um, that are lower than what you might see on uh, Craigslist, for example. So not necessarily so for any given unit. Um, it's, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yes. Council Member Watkins. Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation and thanks to my colleagues for their questions. Um, I really appreciate the intention behind this legislation. I think, you know, we briefly talked about it today, but it really is deeply rooted in race, racial segregation and history. and. Um, definitely our community has been impacted and I've shared in the past that when my parents tried to move here as an interracial couple in the 80s they couldn't find somebody to give them a loan or a realtor to work with them so it's not like it was that that long ago um, that it has impacted our community and who is able to reside here so the banks and the realtors and all um, other aspects of what goes into allowing a family to purchase a home is also a player in addition to some of the work that we're doing here in terms of land use um, and I appreciate the missing middle uh, approach to that. I think that's really important. I think some of the questions I've um, had have been asked. I think people in the community will naturally feel reaction to upzoning and, um, you know, by, uh, you know, zoning or in ease in terms of that. So however we're thinking about that in terms of community engagement and what that means. Um, I just wanted to confirm, I'm assuming that like transit is bus essentially for our community. That's about it. Yeah. Okay. Correct, it's yeah. okay. <laughs> it's both by bus stops and by bus routes. Bus stops and routes. Okay. Um, I just, I just was, I, I assume that was the case, but I just wanted to make sure. Um, I guess my question is in, a, in addition to what has already been asked an in interest in home ownership, um, in terms of the mapping for the opportunity areas, so the, the light gray, just to make sure I'm following it correctly, that's already more or less zoned for higher density. Is that right? In terms of why it's not a high, a moderate, that's why it's labeled moderate resource? Look, we put that back up. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm looking at it on my computer. No problem, yeah. Thank you. Sure, okay, yeah, can you help me understand the map a little bit? I thought, yeah. I, I think I get it, but I just wanted to make sure I'm, I'm following. So the, 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 there are two separate things. There, there's no direct relationship, uh, okay. only that uh, uh, for the opportunity map, it's the state studying economic health and 
education outcomes uh, for the for the residents in these areas, and and then assigning that opportunity score essentially to to those sites. Okay. Um, and so, what you can see is that there there's much greater, uh, of course, is very general, but greater uh, health, education, and economic outcomes uh, for areas that are single family. I see. Okay. That's that's kind of the overlap there. You can you can see there is some correlation between single family zoning and and those higher opportunity areas. So the goal of the state is really to use these opportunity areas to uh, help cities consider AFFH goals. And even in our housing element, for instance, we're using the opportunity map to um, again think of think of ways to add more units to these areas of opportunity. So we're getting these. You know, some of more naturally affordable, moderate to uh, workforce housing type of units in these areas of high opportunity, um, they're also more likely to uh, uh, attain those higher outcomes. And just to make sure I'm, high, high opportunity equals high resource in the map key, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I was tracking it. I, I understand. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. I guess also my question in regards to that map is that the areas that aren't as high in terms of opportunity um, are, as far as I can read, f are also that are not as also transit oriented. Correct? I mean, so I'm wondering where, when you start to like filter through, really where do these apply? And maybe that's the work to come potentially. I I'm assuming, I guess it is. But I kind of was doing that in my head, thinking. Yeah. Yeah, there's so there's really two parts to this. One is the the fact that SB nine allows for four units on single family right now already, but we want to find more ways to allow those four units. Essentially, sure. uh, there's there's opportunity to create more flexibility and, and allow for that uh, to be more easily used and and more economical, feasible for people to use than SB nine currently is. So that's that's one of one part of the project, kind of the main part of the project that we definitely want to do. And then the other part is exploring this SB9 idea where we tie additional units to these areas of, of uh, quality transit. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Let's see what we have. I would add, um, thank you for that question, Councilmember Watkins. Um, the GIS that we have on our website um, shows um, the existing and planned high quality transit corridors. And um, so members of the public can reference that. Um, just make sure you, you put both of those on because those are the areas that qualify um, as well as uh, qualify for the zero parking under AB 2097. But to more directly answer your question about the, um, the location of those across the city, most of our corridors have locations that qualify and it's within a half mile. So um, the Bay mm -hmm. Street corridor um, at Mission and Bay and then going up to the university and a half mile out from there would qualify. And if you look at that Northwest quadrant um, uh, where it shows the high opportunity areas, you know that's gonna cover a big chunk of that as well as um, some of the corridors to the east um, with SoCal, for example, having some of those. And so I think there's gonna be some overlap there on uh, the east side with our high quality transit corridor. So there are some places where we can align the additional units that um, could be offered through SB 10 and um, utilize the, that uh, state allowance to bring in additional units um, into these high opportunity areas. Um, they don't always overlap, but there are some opportunities there for sure. Right. No, thank, thank you for the clarification. Of course. Um, I think, yeah, just to reiterate what has already been said in, in regards to community engagement, I think that's going to be really important. Um, and I do think the objective standards are going to, is an important component that we need to think about, especially as these bigger like units are going into neighborhoods to the com compatibility point you brought up. We want to be really mindful about how those standards are in place. So anyways, I appreciate the presentation and what's to ensue. Thank you, Thank you Council Member. Council Member Bruner is recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Hua. Thank you, uh, Lee Butler. Um, I just had a couple questions. You had mentioned that the project uh, in applying for this 
uh, application and the timeline, the project would be con complete by March 2026. What does the project complete look like? That all the community engagement into what the objective standards are would then be in place? Is that what a complete project would look like? Correct, yes. Okay. Um, it's really interesting that this grant is um, for the development of the objective standards, not, you know, when I read through it, it, at first I thought it was another housing opportunity grant to, to build housing, but it's for the objective standards for this category. Um, so I echo the previous comments about really uh, having a really good community engagement process and input. I think our community has shown that in the past as really uh, a priority in in these processes and having a say. Uh, and um, I'm really happy that you proactively worked with uh, Yimby in this and you know the emails that they sent. I know that council it was in our packet. Uh, regarding the economic feasibility study, so thank you. I was that was one of my questions as well, uh, and um, home ownership opportunities um, as well as rental uh, being looked at in in this process. I think would would be uh, something to really consider. Um, and then my last question. How does it align with the Housing Our Workforce um, report that was recently done? How, how does that, how do those two connect and how does it support? You're referring to the um, civil grand jury report? Yes. Yeah, so I think um, broadly speaking, that report recognized that there are challenges in our community with the amount of housing production that we have. Um, and uh, I think this, um, this project um, will give the opportunity for other options in, in terms of um, how to increase the number of housing units on properties, as well as providing more certainty um, related to that. Uh, with those objective standards, uh, a developer um, would know, all right, if I follow these rules, then I'll be able to proceed. Um, your, your prior statement um, uh, with respect to the grant being focused on the production of housing is accurate. You, you read that correctly. We will need to make the case that by putting these in place, it will result in the production of additional units. And so that's part of what we'll be um, explaining through the grant is just that, um, which aligns with the Housing Our Workforce report, meaning that we need to build more housing for uh, our workforce. And units like this um, have the, the potential mm -hmm. to um, provide um, relatively more affordable um, housing options than uh, many of the, the product types that we currently have on the market, which are, are kind of in those buckets of um, single family detached, not affordable, multifamily with lots of amenities and brand new, um, some inclusionary components to that, but the units themselves um, are often not affordable. And then we've got the um, affordable housing projects, which provide deeper levels of affordability and so we're not always hitting that workforce housing, that 80 to 120% or even up to 150% of area median income. And so um, I think there are opportunities here through that. Um, as, as Matt mentioned, um, I don't see this as an onslaught of, of units. It's, it, you know, oftentimes it'll be mom and pops that choose to redevelop their properties and, and they would have to choose to sell their property if. Um, they wanted to, to leave and have a developer come in. Um, and so it's, it's not going to be um, loads of units, as we're seeing with SB9. You know, we've got a handful, um, a, a couple, I think, that have been uh, approved and, and um, a few that are in process. And over time, that builds additional housing supply.
Thank you. That concludes my question. Councilmember Colin Tar Johnson is recognized. Thank you. Um, I don't have questions, but if I may take just a couple of moments to comment, I really appreciate staff bringing this proposal before us. Um, it is part, part of the larger housing element work that um, the staff is doing, the subcommittee is working on. I see this as bold and innovative, yet have shown success in other communities. And um, I appreciate Vice Mayor Golder's comment on, let's look at other like communities. You know, Minneapolis and Portland don't necessarily represent who we are. So um, I think that would be great if that could be part of the process to see what other like communities have used these tools. Um, I don't see this as committing us to 10 units on a lot. I know everybody's eyes are like, ah! <laughs> Some people may want to see that, but a lot of people will not. So I see this as um, a tool for us to explore what's possible in addressing the missing middle. And I'm so glad that, Councilmember Mama Bruno, you brought that question of how do we define that, right? It's our teachers, it's our firefighters, it's our city employees, and it's us, it's us, <laughs> right? It's all of us in this room, really. And um, um, so it, it's important to, I think, really art explicitly articulate what we mean by missing middle. And then I also appreciate, I appreciate all of my colleagues' comments, but um, Councilmember Brown, like, how do we make sure we get to that? How do we actually make sure that these units will be serving them? Well, I think this is an opportunity with this grant to explore that. Um, so I know I'm kind of repeating what everyone said, but um, I'm excited about this grant. I think it's a great opportunity. It's these types of... Um, projects that have put us on the map in the state and give have us recognized of you know one in uh, one of six across the state to meet our regional housing goals so I commend staff for your vision and being bold and for bringing this before us and I will um, reiterate what's already been said that community engagement will be number one priority I think for all of us and and I'm sure for staff that we we get this right thank you Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Van Waugh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Butler. A um, couple of thoughts on this. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, first, uh, I think this is a really good example of state legislation. And what I mean by that is you have someone from rural northeastern California representing 500,000 people spread across eight counties. And then you have somebody in LA who represents 18 square blocks with the same number of 500,000 people. So when you go to make state legislation, you're asking for the vote of everybody. And so you make state legislation and you end up with, and, and I don't mean this as a criticism, I mean this as an observation, you end up with this kind of bill, that SB9, SB10, the other kinds of, of bills. I think the, the virtue of this particular application is that we get to say, let's see how this applies to Santa Cruz. And I associate myself with, with the other comments that have been made about some of the other examples. I think a couple of, of observations. If you are representing a community, let's say, in the Central Valley, where your community was 30, 40, 50,000 for a very long time, and now it's 150,000, getting onto 200,000 because you have approved massive new subdivision development, the applicability of this is very different than if you're in a town that I don't know when the last time the city of Santa Cruz approved a 100-unit subdivision, but cities do that regularly on Tuesdays. My guess is we haven't done it for decades. And so what we approve are largely multifamily residential and single-family residential. That's what we approve. And uh, because that's the nature of our community. And then we see this, I think it even gets more nuanced as we go literally neighborhood by neighborhood or even two or three blocks by two or three blocks which is to say my colleagues who who for example live on the west side there is a somewhat different um, composition of neighborhoods than let's say i live in midtown it's a it's different it's different so i like this idea of a very granular look at our objective standards because not only what might work in Santa Cruz or what might work in Portland or might work in Minneapolis, St. Paul, might work on the West Clive or might work in the Midtown area and might not work 
on the west side or might what not work someplace else. I think this is a really good application because it lets us say the spirit of the state law wants us to head in this direction. And we all swore to uphold the laws of the state of California, so we're going to do that. <laughs> but how is it we do that in this town, as distinguished from Watsonville or Capitola or Scotts Valley, or the unincorporated area of our county, which houses 50% of the population of the county? I think there's an exceptionally good, and I think the path on this is take your damn time. <laughs> I really mean this. Take our time on this. Get it right. The gentlelady to my right pointed out an extraordinary example of discrimination in her family's history. Um, and that was a stunning statement that you made. And, uh, and discrimination takes all kinds of forms. Hopefully some of what you were talking about is being torn out root by branch as we move along in society and we get better about that. But there are other I think more hidden forms of discrimination in the housing world that beg for this grant to be funded. Because I think it will, I think what we will find is that this is damn near surgical on what we're going to need to do here. We need to be very careful about this to get it right. Not for fear of offending anybody. I, frankly, that doesn't, doesn't worry me too much. What worries me is when you write a law for LA and for Calusa County, how do we get it right in the city of Santa Cruz? That's the part I'm most interested in. And I think we can do it. This council, long before I ever got here, proved that they can do it. Uh, I won't try to mess it up. I'll see if I can stay on track with it. But, but there's an exceptionally good grant, but let's take our time. Let's take our time. Let's take the time we need to do it right. My guess is we don't get a do-over on this. We're going to adopt policies if we do it right they can have some traction and purchase to them. They can, they can really work over time. And so I understand that this grant, if we're successful, has a time frame to it. Uh, let's use all the time available and get it right. Thank you very much for your presentations. Let me ask if there's anybody wish, with us who wishes, please come forward, who wishes to comment on this item. Good afternoon, I'm Jane Heisey. Um, I have lived in Santa Cruz for decades. Um, I am a member of Peace United Church, which is interested in housing, and I specifically have started working with the COPA housing team, uh, which has been working with the city and the county on the housing element. Mm -hmm. I particularly want to add COPA's support um, for moving in this direction, uh, having a lot of housing, but of many different kinds, addressing many different situations makes for a more dynamic community. I want to add that I was able, as an elementary school teacher here in Santa Cruz, able to take advantage of a prior housing workforce housing program in the 90s. I was able to move from being a renter bouncing around as so many people have, you know, as a, as a teacher. Uh, I was able to get a very small one bedroom condo south of Chestnut in Maynard Manson's development, which enabled me to then move into a mobile home park and have a way to stay in this community. So I know these programs can work. They need to be thoughtful. I'm especially, uh, as a retired teacher thinking of ways that families as their economic circumstances change that they can stay in the same general school district in the neighborhood and having rentals, cheaper condos or townhouses, ADUs and then maybe a home while the family is in that general area makes uh, for a much better outcome for the children. Um, so thank you for the direction it appears you're going in. Thank you, and I'm going to use this opportunity to also thank COPA. COPA's persistent engagement on this issue is really helpful. Thank you so much. Okay. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, 
Yeah, good afternoon again. My name is James Ewing Whitman. Kind of like to quote, take our damn time. I'm sure with this group, there's many people who are excellent grant writers who couldn't use an extra three quarters of a million dollars to do all kinds of stuff. There are aspects of this, though, that reminds me of the f April 11th meeting, the consent agenda, agenda item number 16. I think I took two and a half pages of notes, uh, AB 2097. Mm -hmm. So, wow, if a single family dwelling is turned to 10 units, where are those people going to park? <laughs> you, well, it may be funny, but it's not really that funny. Um, so, you know, once again, I still have three minutes, but I'll, it won't take that much time. Um, there seems to be a lot of information going around about smart cities and such, and uh, what I'm learning is that they are going to change the property taxes. So let's say your single family home could have 10 units. So although you haven't don't have 10 units, we're going to charge you property taxes. So who knows what's going to happen in the next, well, hey, I can back it up. I don't have it in my pocket, though. Um, so it's just interesting. I think this will probably be one of the shortest council meetings in a while. Congratulations, all sides. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Anyone else with us today wish to comment on this agenda item? Do we have someone online? We do, yeah. We'll go to the person online. Good afternoon. Okay, hi there. This is Garrett Phillip. Hey, this item represents so well the many vile, destructive, woke attacks on American culture, even exceeding the lizard brain Emperor Newsom's decimation of single family home zoning in SB 9. The directive to facilitate deliberate action to explicitly address, combat, and relieve disparities resulting from past patterns of segregation to foster more inclusive communities is very much like the woke demonic reparations where people who are never slaves are awarded money from people who never owned slaves in a state that never was a slave state and was barely a state at all. It is similar to the odious bill AB 852, which seeks to relatively lower sentences of criminals if they are of a race that historically received larger sentences than other races, perhaps relatively increasing sentences of white defendants for no reason other than their race. The state must believe in punishing people for other people's actions or their shortcomings. That's woke judicial Marxism. That's pure any racist racism. Nobody is preventing anybody from living anywhere. No matter what the price is, if you don't have the jack, there's no living there. You don't just want more middle housing. You want to enable an evisceration of single-family housing to achieve your cultural Marxist goals. Single-family houses are better and more desirable places for families to raise children, and their elimination is a planned target of woke nuclear family destruction. This item proposes to crush the liberty of those like-minded who can afford the most they can for their families. As typical of cultural Marxism, the equity mantra is invoked, which seeks to make everybody equal, even though they are undeniably and will always be different. Uh, this is done not through fostering prosperity, but by destroying those who perceive to have achieved more or have a perceived more successful status by trashing American values and ideals while assigning privilege to those who have achieved far less. Literally, the American dream of a family home with a white picket fence is being squeezed out of existence and extinguished by wokeness. The state's plan to inject more poor people into successful neighborhoods every time a prosperous community thrives is not a positive, and neither does a relentless push to increase density. Portland and Minneapolis are left as cesspools of crime and societal disintegration. How dare you emulate dysfunction? You want less privacy and open space. You want more control. You want more outside dollars lining city pockets, whether it is contrary to the will of the local people or not. This is very much beyond not. You seek to expand the societal damage of SB9 with additional promotional variances, allowing even six units per lot. Outrageous isn't the strongest word I'm thinking of. If you really believe SFR owning citizens on balance want four to six plexes on the, the SFR lot next door, try asking them instead of the woke selfish without means pleading to encode an excess beyond SB9's malfeasance in the muni code. Nope, you have the government knows best disease version of cultural Marxism wokeness. This grant is a bribe that activates salivating at the prospect of more fees and taxes. Feel free, to, feel free to design if you don't shut down expanding density above SB9. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Phillip. Anyone else who's with us? 
we have anything on any other folks online? Two more. Two more. Good afternoon. Welcome to the person online. Three, two, one. We'll go to the oh, next hello. person online. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't know whether this was me. But anyway, uh, thank Fran. you. Uh, my name is Fran Guerrero. I'm, um, uh, sit, I live in Santa Cruz for about 30 years now. And um, I'm a member of Holy Cross Church in Santa Cruz as well as COPA. And uh, so I just wanted to uh, quickly just let you know that uh, I'm in favor at, you know, and I do uh, have also been part of the housing housing strategy team in COPA that Jane had mentioned. But um, I do speak in favor and support of this opportunity uh, to include and or provide uh, the opportunity to include and provide for a more affordable housing, uh, also fair housing practices and workforce housing, um, which also includes includes you know economic diversity and inclusivity. Um, also, as one of our main priorities that uh, we have spoken to uh, in the past is tenant protections. So uh, hopefully that at some point some something some thought can be put into uh, tenant protections against harassment retaliation uh, in in the use of this grant funds and so we support that and um, just wanted to give that uh, information to you thank you thank you very much Ms. Cabrero thank you very much and thank you for your work at COPA Ms. Bush one more person online good afternoon The person online, your opportunity has arrived. Three, two, one, matters back before the council. Okay. Ms. Contar Johnson is recognized. Thank you. I would like to um, move the resolution authorizing staff to apply for State of California REAP 2.0 competitive funding in the amount of 750000 to plan for more inclusive residential infill housing options in neighborhoods. There is a motion. There is a second by Ms. Bruner under discussion. Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit torn here about what to do, and I want to ask a question of my colleagues um, related to the issues we've heard, um, we just heard from uh, somebody from COPA, who, and I know I appreciate you all as well, the work that you do and your advocacy for uh, tenant protections, tenant rights, eviction pr prevention. Those are major, uh, major issues for me. Um, obviously, I think the council is aware of, um, you know, the, the challenges that people are facing. So I'm wondering if um, there could be a more explicit, um, and I don't have a, necessarily an amendment, but a more explicit uh, direction to incorporate um, attention to affor housing affordability. And I, when I say housing affordability um, beyond naturally affordable, I, I just don't believe that exists in our community. So afford deed restricted, I guess, would be a way to say it, affordable housing units and um, uh, tenant protections, way, ways of keeping people housed um, in this process. Just wanted to see how, how people feel about including that as an explicit direction. I think it gets, it's sort of like we gesture to it and then it just gets lost and I worry that that's going to happen here. Uh, if you... Council member, if I might, uh, Mr. Van Waugh, uh, the council member is suggesting something in the area of tenant protections. And I think the question would be, is that an eligible expenditure category in this grant? I'd, I'd have to look more closely, but I believe okay. that would be outside of the scope of the grant because it's really specifically related to housing production um, I wonder what about producing council? deed restricted affordable units that seems to me to be part of I mean that would be a part of it yeah Mr. Van Wall. yeah the, the deed restricted affordable is something we would definitely be exploring through the grant 
Council Member, is that a satisfactory answer, or would you like to add something into the motion on that regard? In that regard, rather. It looks like the ma the maker of the motion may have something. Well, I, I'll wait. Council Member Collintari Johnson. Thank you. I'm just looking at the project scope and the project goals um, as they're outlined in the report and in the presentation. And the fourth bullet in the project scope, new objective standards for affordable SB 10 units beyond for economic, I, I might have written this around wrong, but economic feasibility analysis. Um, I wonder if that gets to it or if we can explicitly make that a little bit more explicit in this project scope, the fourth project scope. I, I don't want to hold this up, so I'm, I'll just say that that's much too limited for my uh, taste because that really does rely on the potential to get, you know, a couple more units on a on a major upzoning project, and and I don't know that I would support that upzoning, and it doesn't. I don't know that the council would either. So that's a very limited mm -hmm. uh, space or trajectory for getting actually affordable units. Um, so I I don't want to hang it up. I think I'll just um, if I could, Mayor, I'll just make a comment, and I'm I'm going to register a no vote on this. Um, I, um, I, I, I think we do need to get a handle on objective standards. I want to see the community engagement, and I appreciate um, all and, and agree with much of what I've heard from my colleagues about the potential for uh, the use of this funding. Uh, unfortunately, I have uh, my, my experience here has caused me to be quite cynical, and, um, and I don't see a lot of pathways for um, really f focusing in on the issues that I care about related to affordable housing. If we're going to ask neighborhoods to take <laughs> a significantly higher density, um, you know, we should be uh, explicit about demanding affordability in that. And, and I just don't see it here. I also want to say, um, again, I appreciate the work that our planning staff does. Um, but I think the city has been uh, perhaps too bold. I would call it bullish on um, infill development uh, under SB9. And I want to just reference uh, some feedback I've been hearing from community members, homeowners, who are trying to build ADUs. And I've heard this is three ex discrete examples now um, of people who are being pushed to build out the max allowable under SB9. And they come in with an ADU project and are pushed. And they're nervous about that. Um, I don't know the details, and I'm, I'd like to follow up, but this has just been coming to my attention recently. I feel like in that context, um, this, is, this money will be a vehicle for um, getting even more bullish. Uh, and, and it just makes me very uncomfortable. And I think the public, a lot of members of the public as well. So I'm going to vote no um, with the hopes that we actually get community engagement. <laughs> Thank you. May I just? Certainly. Um, I'm taking your advice, Mayor, of taking our time. Um, and I know we have another item, and there are people here. Um, but Councilmember Brown, it would be great if we had a unanimous support of this. Um, if you have some recommended explicit friendly amendment language, I would love to hear it at this time. Well, I guess the, the language would be um, direct staff to include attention to uh, the production of deed restricted affordable housing opportunities right attention to deed restricted affordable housing opportunities explicitly and is that feasible okay director butler absolutely yes uh, i think that's going to inherently be a part of if we're exploring additional uh, units beyond the four that would be required under sb9 um, then yes, we would be looking to see if there are opportunities. And I think the feasibility study goes directly to that and understanding where we may be able to um, require that and still um, have those uh, units be produced. So if, if you'd like to make that friendly amendment, I would accept it. Did, Ms. Brown? Did you get the language? Okay. I'll go with it. I, I, I remain, my reservations remain, but I'll go with it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Contar Johnson. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Uh, Councilmember Brunner, did you have a? We're I'm we're good now. We're good. Thank you for addressing. Good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Further debate or discussion on the motion? Seeing and hearing none. Clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Brown. Aye. 
Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Palantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We are on item 18, the State of Child and Youth Wellbeing Report for the 2022-23 uh, year. Ms. Murphy, I believe, will be, maybe not, We'll be presenting on. I'll be I'll be introducing it. Say it again. I'll be introducing this. <laughs> Please proceed. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Um, thank you for your patience. Uh, those of you who are here for this item. So this is um, on the Child and Youth Wellbeing Report. This is we're excited to bring you the first ever in our county in our city, the State of the Child Youth Wellbeing Report. Um, so I'll just give a little bit of background and pass it on to my colleagues who I've been working with on this. Um, so I hope we can all agree that all children, all youth in our community deserve healthy, um, fulfilling lives. And I hope that we can all agree that every single child in our community deserves that, no matter where they're born, what they look like, what language they speak. And in order to do this, we need the right resources, we need to provide the right opportunities and the right experiences that will allow them to reach their full potential. Um, and I think many of us here and many of those listening agree to this and understand this, um, but we have a long way to go to make this an actual reality in our community. Um, you know, as you all know, the children don't have voting rights until the age of 18, uh, but the decisions that we make on programs and policies and budgets affect their everyday lives. So um, one of the ways that we wanted to address this is really focus on what the needs of, our of uh, the children and youth in our community are. And we did this by committing to um, a framework. So in 2021, December of 2021, we, this council uh, passed the Children and Youth Bill of Rights unanimously uh, because we recognize that in the absence of an accountable framework, it's easy to um, not prioritize children and youth in our decision making. Um, we were the first in a county to pass the Bill of, Bill of Rights. The County Board of Supervisors followed suit and the City of Capitola recently did the same. One of our commitments for the Bill of Rights is to establish this report every other year. Um, to hear from our youth in the community, to hear from parents in the community, and then use this as a tool for our decision making. And Ms. Nicole Brown will talk about what that, what that looks like, this report as a tool. Um, we also committed to um, uplifting youth voice and giving youth opportunities to serve in leadership capacities. So we're excited that in the last six months, we've had a youth that we've been working with who's been serving in the youth liaison role who will be presenting with us today. And I think with that, we're just, we're excited to have you here. We're excited for this first report. I'm gonna pass it on to my colleagues, Council Member Watkins and then Vice Mayor Golder. Well, thank you, uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson for that kickoff of an introduction. It's been a pleasure to work on this report with our, um, my colleagues here, as well as our community members and our youth and staff and consultant. Um, you know, one of the things that I feel one is somewhat interesting and in, on the heels of our previous conversation around what mobility means for youth also relies on where they reside and what they have access to, their safety, how they feel, are they able to go to a good school and feel engaged. And so our decisions influence that in many ways, from land use decisions to prioritizing youth in this way. And one of the things that I feel really proud of is our uh, commitment to supporting youth in funding through our um, dedicated children's fund, through the city's dedicated children's fund. Um, the voters chose to have a portion of those dollars invested into youth in perpetuity. Um, and that will help us actualize some of the ways that we wanna see this uh, plan move forward, uh, not only this year, but for many years to come. And having a bill of rights is a wonderful thing, but actualizing the goals set forth in a Bill of Rights is something completely different. And to do that, we need to have attention and focus, and this is one way that we can do that. So I just want to thank my colleagues here, as well as our community, our youth as well, for being part of the process to make sure that we're moving forward with the goals set forth in the Bill of Rights. And 
it's ongoing, it's iterative, and it's about continuous improvement. And this is the first of many and is foundational, and I'm really proud to have been a part of it and really grateful to my colleagues and our, and our community for that reason. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, so through this process, we had our very first State of the Youth Community um, meeting, and it was really exciting to see representatives from various groups from um, preschool all the way up through college, and um, they gave a, a brief talk about what the experience is for children in this community at various ages, and then we had breakout sessions, and it was um, our first opportunity to have an event like this, and staff worked really hard. Lisa and Nicole put together a, a great format where there was a lot of engagement, and we got a lot of feedback from the participants, some of whom were parents, some of the, whom were kids. And it was just um, an awesome opportunity to just take a little pulse. And we know it was not a huge group, and we hope to have um, more events like this as the years go on. But it was an opportunity um, that got us some information that we're going to share in this report tonight. So with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and introduce Nicole to come on up. And she'll take it away from here. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Nicole Young, and I recognize uh, several faces up there on the on the dais. Uh, for those of you that may not know me, I'm Nicole Young. I'm a local consultant. I work with a number of nonprofit organizations, uh, local public agencies, doing um, planning together and taking action together. And so I'm really pleased to be here this afternoon as you launch and release this first ever state of child and youth well-being in the city of Santa Cruz. I feel really lucky to have been part of this project that was led by clearly some very passionate and knowledgeable uh, council members who really uh, held that vision and provided uh, great feedback and really used their resources and relationships to make this a really good process. I loved the words that some of you used around it's iterative, uh, it's taking the pulse, it's something to continue doing, it's ongoing, um, and really I feel like you just gave the presentation for me, so. <laughs> but um, I do want to say that what I'm going to focus on today is not necessarily like walking you through specific data points. I'm going to leave you to read through that um, in your spare time. But what I wanted to focus on today was how, you know, what are some ways that you can use this report as a tool, as a policy-making tool, um, as a living tool for action. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see as, as um, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson started off saying that really this report itself reflects multiple frameworks and models that you as a city, as a council already use, that you already have adopted. And so this report was just an opportunity to integrate those and align those and be really specific about how they relate to each other. So you have your tremendous a uh, trend-setting bill of rights, right, which really is your statement about what the city believes in, what you stand for, uh, what your goals are. And then this is layered with the core conditions for health and well-being, which is a, a model, a framework for defining and articulating vital conditions of well-being that need to be in place for every child and youth and family to be able to thrive. And that takes investing in programs and policies and partnerships the whole gamut to be able to create those conditions of well-being. So in this report, the Bill of Rights and the core conditions are married together and then paired with data, community level data at a county level, state level, when it's available at a city specific level to really paint a picture of what does well-being look like for children and youth in your city right now. Um, and so you'll see that some of, and when it's available, there are some symbols that indicate trends so if you see a green plus sign, it means that the data is moving in the right direction compared to the previous time it was measured. Uh, if you see a, a red X, it means the data is um, not moving in the direction we would want it to. And so that raises questions about why might that be? What can, um, what can be done about that? Is there a role? What kind of role is there for the city? If you see a, just a blue circle, it just means it didn't change much since the last uh, time that that data was collected. So together, that there's a lot of information, a lot of data in the report. Um, there are many other data points that could be looked at, that could be interesting, 
this is a starting place to start to pull some of these again together as a cohesive framework. And it becomes especially powerful when you then combine that with the community insights that came out of the community meeting that Vice Mayor uh, Golder was describing. So really, that's what we mean by the framework, combining all of those in a very explicit and intentional way. Go to the next slide. And the report can also be used as a policy tool. So when you take that framework and you pair that with a look at your current city investments and programs in relation to each of the rights in the Bill of Rights, in relation to the core conditions, in relation to the community insights, it starts to point to patterns and trends around strengths, gaps and challenges, and then opportunities for action. So opportunities for action for the city in terms of the kinds of partnerships that you, that you develop or enhance, the kinds of programs you're investing in, either leading yourselves or in partnership with others, the kinds of practices or ways of doing business that you adopt as a city, the kinds of policies and budget decisions that you make as a council, as a city. So all of those uh, could contain some opportunities for action. And then the real power, the next slide, is when you think about this report as both a framework and a policy tool together. And uh, uh, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson uh, quoted one of the uh, quotes from the report that came from an article on reimagining children's rights in the United States that just says so clearly, you know, in the absence of an overarching and coherent framework and system of accountability to ensure every child achieves their optimal health and well-being, children in the United States in Santa Cruz County, in the city of Santa Cruz, face increasing inequalities and in health outcomes. And so that should be like our vision, right? Our North Star, our, our reason, our why, that we're, that we're creating this and articulating this coherent framework and system of accountability so that collectively, right, you have the tools, you have the resources to address those. Next slide. And this report, tool, the data, it's just one of several levers of change that you have. Right? And so if you think about <clears throat> moving gears, right? the well-being report is one piece of that, along with the Children's Fund, along with the youth liaison position that you've created and the city's representation in the Youth Action Network, along with your health and all policies approach that you've adopted. Uh, Councilmember Watkins actually brought to my attention that there's an international movement to adopt a children in all policies approach. So, just saying. Um, and so, you know, and then there are other countywide initiatives that the city is either involved in or could directly influence. So things like the Children's Network, Core Investments, Thrive by Five, Family First Prevention. If you're hearing me say these things and you're like, I don't know what any of that is, just take that as a sign of, ooh, there's something there that maybe would be helpful and good to look into further, because these are all related. Next slide. And a few other things I wanted to highlight that were some really intentional choices in the report um, and the way that things were phrased to really highlight particular narratives or ways of thinking about things. Uh, I want to highlight just a few of those. So one of them, for example, is, is the way that we're looking at demographic data. So it's common um, to look at demographic data and in this case, uh, race and ethnicity, and look at, when you look at like the individual racial and ethnic backgrounds, so like, oh, well, that's a really small percentage. It's a really small number, right? And that can often lead to either directly or kind of an implied message of, well, that's too small to really warrant doing something, right? And it sends that message of, um, either you're not seen, or you don't matter, or don't matter enough. And so really what we're trying to highlight here is that message of inclusion and belonging, um, and that this, you know, to me it was actually striking to take a look at collectively, the majority of children and youth under age 25 in the city of Santa Cruz are black, indigenous, Latino, or Latine people of color. So when you look at all those groups together, that's the majority of your children and youth, right? And so it's a way to acknowledge and really bring into the conversation that explicit acknowledgement of the disproportionate impact of structural inequities that have been based on race and ethnicity, not just in the city of Santa Cruz, but you know, in all of our society. And so it's a way for this report to convey that message that the city sees you, right? We see you. 
Other intentional things in the report were to, you know, be real and to identify challenges and inequities that do exist, but to serve as that reminder that, that we have to continually ask these questions like, well, what factors contribute to that? What factors contribute to those trends? And there, I'll tell you, there's always going to be many answers to that. And so that's the key is, right, to ask the question, to search out those, those multiple answers that lead to the next question and set of answers around what are the opportunities for action by the city of Santa Cruz. So the example I'm showing on the slide here is a particular um, data point from the report that basically is saying when it comes to emotional wellness, that the percentage of students in Santa Cruz City Schools District, percentage of students who did not say that they experienced frequent or chronic sadness or hopeless feelings in the past 12 months, that, that percentage actually improved, meaning that fewer students are saying that. So that's why you see that green plus sign. But then if you take a closer look, you'll see that, well, the percentage of students who are saying they did not experience chronic or frequent sadness gets lower as the age increases, as the grade level increases. Right? So there could be many reasons for that. The key, again, is to ask ourselves continuously what factors contribute to that, and then what are the opportunities for action by the city. Next slide. Similarly, uh, it's also important to acknowledge and amplify strengths and assets. Sometimes it's really easy to get stuck in a um, problem mindset, a strength, a deficit-based mindset, and so we really sometimes have to exercise that muscle <laughs> to really look for and amplify the strengths, the positive things. And so I've included some examples here, some excerpts from the report that came from the community meeting. Uh, the first one in that kind of yellowish uh, text box was actually a comment from someone in the meeting who said, well, yes, it can be concerning that there's an increase in need for mental health services. And it could also mean that things are uh, actually good because maybe there's less stigma around reaching out for support and services. So then again, the question becomes, what factors have contributed to that? What are the opportunities for action if you know things like there's now more willingness or maybe less hesitation to reach out for support when it's needed. So what are the opportunities for action around that? Um, so again, amplifying strengths and assets when you have that opportunity. And then finally, last thing I'll highlight on the last slide, um, that the report provides a reminder of um, the importance of seeking out and explaining the interconnections or interconnectedness of the core conditions. So for example, uh, on the slide you'll see uh, the right number three from the Bill of Rights highlighted, it speaks to um, safe and healthy environments, including homes and schools and neighborhoods and communities. And that really that in and of itself speaks to multiple core conditions. And the idea being that the presence or absence of well-being in one core condition is often caused by or then contributes to the presence or absence of well-being in another core condition. So they're very much connected, and that's how we should be thinking about both um, challenges as well as solutions and the opportunities for action. So that's where I will stop, and then I will turn it over to Jonah Chazinski, who is the city's youth liaison. I was very involved in planning the community meeting, uh, recruiting other youth to attend, uh, and so. Very lucky to have him here with us today. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Jonah Chizinski, and I am a senior at Santa Cruz High School. And as you heard, I'm also serving as the youth liaison for the city. Um, it's been awesome getting to work on especially this project, setting up uh, the youth summit that we had last spring, and eventually getting to speak here. It's great that we're, to see that we're actually taking action and just to see in the Bill of Rights too, you know, so much of our community relates to the youth, yet, uh, like Shebra said earlier, they can't vote. And it's cool that the people who can vote were able to set up a list of things that actually relate to the youth, kind of, you know, gifting them some rights in the Bill of Rights that relates to them. Um, so there are still a few things that I want to reiterate from the Youth Summit we had in spring and just some issues that are still going on that I'd like to highlight, and it was cool seeing in the report what has improved. Um, first off, mental health. That's a big issue, um, you know, amongst everybody, but especially in the youth, we've seen a lot more issues come out during the pandemic and in COVID. 
Uh, we're lucky to live in such a beautiful place, but obviously there are a number of issues. Um, and a lot of this actually relates to school. So I want to bring up in school, we see a lack of motivation often. Um, you know, it all kind of ties back to COVID and being schooled on our computers for two years. But um, yeah, so counseling in schools, I believe that that's something that I'd like to highlight a little more. Uh, one example of where we saw kind of a push on it is after the false code shooting in October, uh, false school shooting in October. Afterwards, we um, really pushed forward counseling opportunities to help with kids' mental health. And I think that that push that our school administration did is what we should do all year long. I feel like we need that mental support, not just in times of crisis, but, you know, therapy is expensive. Not a lot of people want to do it. So I think having these little opportunities to just talk to someone in school is very helpful. Um, and that leads to my next point that relates to academics is support and college help. So as a senior, I'm going through the whole exhausting process of applying to colleges and going through writing essays, et cetera. And I've noticed there's a lot of people that aren't really even aware of the process. And that's another way that I want our school to kind of step in more is like actually set up meetings with students and say, hey, this is what's going to happen next year. Here's what you need to do. Um, I'm lucky enough to meet with a college counselor and you know, figure out the process, but a lot of people don't have that support. And, you know, as we're setting up the support for children in their childhood, I also think it's important to set them up for a better future once they are of voting age and can use their own voices. Also, physical health is a big thing. I, I saw in one of the reports, I don't know if it was on those slides we just had up, but a lot of, I didn't read the exact statistics, but I know that, you know, physical health hasn't been as highlighted in the past, and I believe that that is a big part of mental health. Um, I'm a big surfer. I like doing jujitsu, and I see exercise as a fantastic thing for mental health, and I'd like it if we could kind of give more opportunities for people to get involved in exercise, whether it's in school. You know, a lot of people, we have PE classes, but um, it seems like they're not a very, uh, I, don't, I don't know how it works, but I don't see a lot of people, I don't know a lot of kids that take PE, and I feel like that's just another aspect of health that really goes into not just mental health, but physical health, too. Um, another point is, and this actually kind of relates to the past topic we had about housing. And this really relates to what I have heard from my community and my friends, you know, living on the Lower West Side. One big part of our social life is the Circle Church. And hanging out there, we play wiffle ball there during the summer. We bike around there at night, go in there and play basketball. And, you know, it's been beautiful to see all the art that's going on there. I'm not exactly aware of what the plan is as to that area if we're turning into housing. But I just want to say that, you know, this is one topic that uh, at least just me and my friends, you know, really care about. And, you know, having that as a center of our community is, it's, that place holds great value to us. You know, we all grew up there playing basketball there. We'd have birthday parties there. Um, so I just want to address that that is a, you know, a, it has a deep place in our hearts in the center of our neighborhood. And I know, I don't know how far we are into the plan of what's going to happen with that place. Um, but yeah. So that's about all the topics I wanted to cover. I just want to say again, it's been fantastic serving as the youth liaison and I look forward to what we continue to do. I want to say a big thank you to Shebra for helping this and everybody on our meetings that we've had, but Shebra especially as we've had our check-ins a couple times a month and just setting an outline for what we are able to do in this community for the youth. And thank you. Jonah, if you would, Jonah, come back. Oh, thank you. That was terrifically well done. Thank you. It was a very, very good job, and I know this is part of a process, and thank you for being involved in it. Yeah, You're of course. Very thank you. Articulate young man. Good work. Keep up that good work. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Anyone else? So that's the end of the presentation. Yeah. End of the presentation. Questions by or comments by council members? I Vice would, mayors. Thank right. you. I would just like to follow up on a couple of the points um, that Jonah brought up. 
um, where Santa Cruz City Schools is stepping up to address some of the things that you're concerned about. And so just so that you and the public are aware that uh, there is social emotional counselors that are at all the secondary schools now that's addition in addition to the regular counselors. We have full-time counselors at all of our elementary schools. We have a um, social worker for, dedicated just to the elementary school and social work interns that have been instrumental in helping children and youth. Um, I do agree that there is a deficit in this community about uh, outside counseling for, for students outside of school. So I think um, having, having more access to that in the community, whether you have insurance or don't, ha or don't have insurance or you're on Medi-Cal, there's a real you know, lack of that. I also want to say that PE is only required till ninth grade. That's state law. Yeah, so that's where you are with that. And um, the Santa Cruz City Schools also added two directors to student services to take on this challenge and really considers student mental health just a foundational part of a student's experience in Santa Cruz City Schools. They've gone on to include positive behavior um, intervention and support to the secondary. We've implemented that at the elementary school um, for about 10 years now. And second step, our social emotional learning program is also being started at the middle and high schools. Um, and then they're piloting a new program where it's, and I forget the name of it, but they use it up in Sacramento, where you're able to do check-ins on a more frequent basis with students asking some of those same questions that are on the social emotional health survey and you can customize them and change them and then you can immediately disaggregate the data based on socioeconomics, race, grade level, all sorts of things and then um, target and, and, and intervene when needed. And so that's something that's really excited, exciting and we're moving forward with. But I, I do thank you, Jonah, for um, those comments and questions. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Other questions, comments? The members, Ms. Brown. I'll just take the opportunity to say thank you to my colleagues for your work on this and to our staff for your work. Um, this sounds, it's, it's great to see some baseline information and to really have the, the qualitative uh, narrative around that um, really gives a, a picture of what the commitments are, what the needs are, and um, I just want to say uh, to Jonah, thank you for serving in this role um, and for stepping up to um, share your thoughts. Uh, use that position, and, and I'm sure you will in your future. Um, keep pushing us to do better. Um, keep pushing, because we, we say it and we have that commitment, and then sometimes, um, or, or for a variety of reasons, you know, things get lost. So keep pushing us. Come, keep coming back. Thank you. Further, Ms. Bruner is recognized. Just a, a brief comment um, that this report was really visually well done and easy to understand and read through, and the data was very interesting. And so receiving this report, this is um, a first time to, and, and this is what's exciting, is that we can build from here and um, this is a great starting point. So I know a lot of work went into this. So um, thank you to everyone who has put the work into this. And I just want to really emphasize um, the importance of healthy children, well-being, and their well-being. Parents and families need to also be healthy and well and supported in order for those children. So when we're talking about what action factors that contribute an opportunity for action that the city can contribute, it's, it's really um, not just youth and children programs, but also adult programs and, and funding and investment in any capacity that, that supports parents. And, and housing, it ties back to housing too, and housing stability and financial support, um, mental health as well. So thank you for getting this um, look. You know, it's a snapshot, it's a start. And, um, and I really like and appreciate what you said, Council Member Watkins. Um, so, thank you for this foundation. Further. 
when it's time, I'll have some wrap-up comments. You want me to make them now? Sure. Okay. I just have one more quick comment, and that is that I think that this also shows the community that our, it's a commitment to an upstream prevention of future homelessness in our, and future, um, you know, societal problems in taking a big um, commitment in into our youth. So that's all. Might be why you dedicated your life to this. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Thank you. That was part of my wrap up. No, no that's perfect. Matters, matters back before the council. <laughs> the mayor would be glad to entertain a motion. Oh, do we? Okay. Well, so I'll uh, make a motion to accept the report. There's motion. I'll second. Second by Ms. Watkins. And I'll Move just. Up. Oh, sorry. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, I'm open jumping on ahead. Motion. Open on your motion. Um, just some, some wrap-up comments. Um, I also want to just thank everyone involved in this report and in the process, and thank you specifically, Nicole and Jonah. Um, you know, we heard a couple of things from you, Jonah, around met mental health, physical activity, social connectivity, um, safe spaces to be. That, that's what I heard. And, and you named it in the context of schools, because that's your experience, that's your life. You spend most of your life there. And I want to invite us to think about it in the context of the city and the role of the city, because we do have a role in each of those things that were named by Jonah, that were highlighted by Nicole, and that are in the report. Um, you know, what are the opportunities for action? What other questions do we need to ask ourselves um, on these data points and the points that, Jana, that Jonah brought up? Um, so I think just th th those were my closing comments on that. This is upstream. This is so that we can um, prevent folks from going a path that is not letting them reach their full potential. And it's opportunities like this, hopefully, that will get more youth engaged and involved in coming up to the podium and speaking up and, and sharing your concerns and what you'd like to see with us. Ms. Watkins. And I, too, will just add to my colleagues' uh, comments and appreciation for their comments today, as well as the comments by our presenters and our young, our, our young folks, uh, Jonah here, as well. Um, I just want to highlight what Nicole brought up in terms of the intersection between what this is, the health and all policies framework we have in place, the intersection between what that means in terms of a community that's rooted in a county, that's rooted in a state, that also has partners in education, partners in workforce development, um, all types of, of opportunities to say, how do we all play a role in supporting the sex success of our youth? And also to the comments that Councilmember Bruna brought up, in terms of having a healthy foundation for our young people. It starts with supporting our parents and guardians. And um, one thing that we have in place because of the Children's Fund is relief for a parent looking for a scholarship, for example, to allow their child to participate in one of our Parks and Rec programs. Mm -hmm. And that relief helps their anxiety around affordability. It helps with the affordability and balance that we see that plays out in housing. So it's all interconnected, and how we remember that in terms of where we reside and our role in the solutions to the interconnectivity to support the well-being and the upstream investments of our youth that was brought up by my colleagues. So um, this is a big issue, but we have a role, and this is a great celebration of our place and our contributions and our commitment to, to what can be possible here. So. Thank you very much, and thank you, thank you to all that made this possible. Thank you. Let me see if there are other comments folks wish to make. All debate having ceased, clerk will call the roll. We do have someone online for public comment. I'm sorry, excuse me. Thank you for pointing that out. Person online, good afternoon. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I thought you were going to skip us. Anyway, item 18 contains a youth report that indicates 2 to 5% of students in grades 7 to 9 identified their gender as transgender, and similar numbers said they weren't very sure. That's a clanging warning bell that all is not well with too many children's process of developing their identity, and they are confused. That amount of denial of biological reality is looney tunes. The survey indication between 19 and 30 percent have a sexual orientation other than hetero or are not so sure is another concern, especially since that age group has little to zero actual sexual discovery experience to preference. Both sound ridiculously high. Speaking of high, trans suicide rates are evidence of severe mental issues. I'm thinking these numbers indicate kids are being indoctrinated into thinking being queer is culo, or it is also a manufactured easy group membership identity answer. Group identities are a valued piece of growing up, but most all groups have earned membership and the associated reward status like band, cheerleading, sports, all that stuff. 
The LGBT so-called community has few to no membership performance requirements, but does have then these unearned rewards of being in an easy group membership, uh, which is assigned them by cultural Marxists, unlike other groups, even literally being rewarded in the council chambers, which can serve to plaster over, not resolve, the growing pains and emotional struggles in normal child development and identity discovery in some people. I watched this self-admitted non-binary drag queen trashy indoctrinating children in public front and center on Pacific on Saturday, surrounded by it looked like queer activists with Antifa-like rainbow umbrellas, reality check it wasn't raining, and the usual pride regalia talking fairies and explaining queer terms to five-year-olds. Real drag queens know they're men. While what occurred was not as inappropriate as public school youth queer crusading indoctrination, it did seem to be purposely the maximum reach public display possible, touching at times on queer ideologies, displaying symbols, and ideas directed at extremely young children. Mental health issues can be thought of as the complexity of life being too much for a person's mental model of reality to process, a model which is under construction in children and can be overloaded, and queer crusading offers easy non-answers to growing up difficulties. It makes me wonder about the health and wellness children's events and the parks and rec fall activity guides, such as gender neutral kids and friends club or the LGBTQIA teen hangout. When gender affirming becomes trans crusading, mentored by unqualified children, no less, instead of mental health counseling for those who need it, yep, we have an overload of 10% of children with gender confusion. And lastly, hey, when are your presenters gonna learn not just to read their slides? Thanks. Thank you, sir. Anyone else online? Person online, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sarah Emmert. I'm the Director of Community Impact with United Way of Santa Cruz County. Um, I want to acknowledge those that had a role to play in moving forward the city's Children and Youth Bill of Rights, all that went into this report. Um, and some notable things that I wanted to name I really appreciated Council Member Golder explicitly saying that this is about an upstream approach. Um, when Nicole mentioned the levers for change piece, the racial equity points highlighted in the report, as well as all of your commitments to turning the Bill of Rights into action. Santa Cruz City's efforts are raising the bar for other jurisdictions in this county. As Council Member Kalantari Johnson mentioned, shortly after Santa Cruz City passed its Bill of Rights, the county passed it and then most recently Capitola City. Over the past year, the Children's Network has prioritized three of the county's Children and Youth Bill of Rights and is doing a deeper dive into them, exploring ways to operationalize them. We, as well as the other jurisdictions, can learn a lot from Santa Cruz City's process. We, as in the Youth Action Network and the Children's Network, are working with the other jurisdictions to pass the Bill of Rights as well. And in 2018, United Way published the County Youth Wellbeing Spotlight Report. Uh, we are excited to dive deeper into your state of child and youth well-being data, noting where positive change has occurred, as well as while we can continue to do better as a community to uh, ensure that all youth are thriving. United Way is committed to elevating the work of Santa Cruz City and working alongside you to increase youth well-being in our community. You can count on us, including the Youth Action Network and the Children's Network to support the city in getting the word out about ways for young people to get involved in the community and to encourage other jurisdictions to learn from Santa Cruz City's efforts. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? Okay, very good. Better, sir, please come forward. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, Hi. My name's Owen Lawson. I'm friends with Jonah Jasinski. Um, we'll overlook that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add a couple comments. Um, namely, you were talking about parks and recreation and getting more kids involved. That made me think is when I did junior guards with the Santa Cruz City, the majority of the kids were white and the majority of them were from families that surfed and were already involved in the ocean, which is fine, but it, it does seem to be a little lopsided, and it could be helpful to have the same type of training that they do in junior guards integrated into maybe like Bayview, like have a fire truck come by, teach them a bunch of things. I definitely learned so much from that, and it was very helpful in my life now. Um, 
Another thing is... I forgot what I was going to say. That's it. Have, have a great day. Well, well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. I was obviously kidding Jonah, but, but thank you both so much for being here. If you remembered your comment, go ahead. I, I just did. Um, I was also thinking about that Jonah and I, we have very specific issues that affect us as friends and as being in the same group. But the issues that affect us don't really affect all the kids in Santa Cruz. It's a very limited view into the issues of the kids of Santa Cruz. And a lot of the kids don't even know this position exists. A lot of the kids don't know that they could contact Jonah and say, oh, this is an issue that I'd like to have resolved. And it gives you guys and Jonah a very limited scope of what the youth needs. It gives us a very, uh, gives you some, but mm -hmm. like, Jonah goes to Santa Cruz High. I go to Santa Cruz High as well. What about Harbor High? What about PCS? There's a bunch of different schools. There's different organizations that are underrepresented. And that may just because this is a new thing, but it can it can change, I'm sure. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I had to say. Thank you. I'm glad you remembered your second point. It was quite good. Thank you so much for being here. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, hello. You know, I'll be brief. I didn't read the report. Sure seems like quite the Cinderella story. Not really the Cinderella story I'm getting from my friends who have high school kids about what's going on. So I'll read the report before I comment further. Good idea. Thanks. Good idea. Thank you very much. Further. Matter of respect for the council, motion's been made, seconded. All debate having ceased, the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Thank you all for your very fine work. Best wishes to you. We are on, under oral communication. I'm going to take the privilege of the chair to introduce Terrence Concannon, who just arrived here from Lake Havasu City and is now our brand new Visit Santa Cruz County Executive Director. Good afternoon. Welcome to the city. Thank you very much. I cannot tell you how excited I am, and it's not just because it's 79 here and it's 119 degrees when I left uh, Lake Havasu City. No, I have had a history with uh, Santa Cruz uh, County. Uh, I discovered this county, I think in 1985, I was driving in my car in Southern California and I heard a band called Camper Van Beethoven on, on K-Rock. And I loved the music so much that my buddies and I came up here. This is also the first place where I failed at surfing. I have failed at surfing three times and I've given it up after those. This is the first <laughs> place I did it and the only place I've ever worn a wetsuit. But to be perfectly uh, serious, I just want this, uh, this body to know and the people that are here and watching us on TV that I'm super excited to be a part of this community. I moved here a week ago. It's been one of the best weeks of my life. I was able to uh, get a place within walking distance of downtown. And for somebody who's lived out in the rural desert, it is so exciting to be able to walk and to walk to all these different conveniences. This is a fantastic county. It's a fantastic community. You guys should be very proud of all the things you've done. What I've heard here today is remarkable and I'm really, really proud to be a part of this community. I will let you know that under my leadership, Visit Santa Cruz County will pay attention to every, every part of this county, every community. Uh, tourism is one of the most um, uh, gratifying forms of economic uh, uh, development. It's something I have basically given my career to. It's something I am I'm proud to admit I'm a total geek about tourism. I really believe in it, and I really believe that it's good for this community. The last thing I'll leave you with is under my leadership, visit Santa Cruz County, our number one customers, the ones that we care about the most are the citizens and residents of this county. We may reach out to bring people into this community and to maximize our tourism revenue, but at the end of the day, I'm a citizen, my staff are citizens, and we believe in this county and we will do everything we can to make this not just a better place for people to visit, but a better place for all of us to live. So thank you for having Mr. me. Mr. Kincan, thank you very much. Welcome to town. I know that you, a couple of your, if I understand it correctly, board members uh, are right here. Nice to and meet I'm you. Sure Welcome. Very, uh, to see you. very happy to see you and, and to hear your very positive comments. Thank you, sir. Wonderful. Thank you again. Certainly.
Please come forward. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Council Members and Mayor. My name is Jennifer Zider. I live at 403 Seabright Avenue. I believe it's Council Member Bruner's um, district, if I'm not mistaken. I'm here to speak about the um, proposal to make permanent outdoor dining and or bar establish establishments in the city of Santa Cruz, uh, a la in the wake of COVID that have now been extended through March of 2024. Um, I am a neighborhood representative. Uh, we have been working with uh, Rebecca, I believe, and Josephine in the Economic Development Council regarding the expansion and um, community input. If I could um, ask someone to please distribute these, I don't know if I have enough. This is the if you uh, the hand plot those map. To the clerk, if you would just walk over there and hand it to the clerk, she'll be glad to distribute. Thank you. This pertains to a particular local establishment named Brady's. Um, I've been there many times. Um, it's a nice little neighborhood bar. It was a nice compact neighborhood bar with limited noise. Um, until the advent of the expansion, and now what we have is, I believe, a health and safety uh, matter in the in the neighborhood. Um, most of us that surround that are, in fact, homeowners and reside there. Um, I know it's been said that there were short-term rentals, and yes, there are some certainly error, but they are also entitled to peace and quiet during their stay to this lovely city, because we know that tourism is an important aspect. Um, what we have experienced since COVID is really a doubling, if not tripling, of the occupancy of that particular establishment. Um, the outdoor is a, a hodgepodge of kitchen tables and chairs that people have brought in. Um, the amount of people that are frequenting that until 2 a.m. is strictly, it's, it's appalling. Um, we have, um, I'll show you pictures as well, um, regular puke on my fence, okay? Um, if I could pass those around, regular drug baggies, this is on a regular basis, in addition to whippets that are dropped into our yards. Um, broken fences, mine has been broken so many times. You're, um, if I could ask for a couple, a minute Please. or two, I appreciate that, thank you very much. Um, broken fences, um, broken cars, um, the neighbor next door was actually, when he tried to um, go down and ask people to, to be quiet, was punched in the face, and a few weeks later, a rock was thrown through his front glass window. Um, we have regular beer cans and other paraphernalia. I've seen condoms. I've seen people having sex when they walk in through a gate two doors down from, Brody, uh, from Brady's. So what we have here is becoming a public nuisance. Again, I've been here since 2001, so I know I bought into an area, but it was very contained at Brady's. It stayed within the perimeter. Um, and we used to uh, talk about the 2 o'clock drop when the people go home afterwards. And we realize they're getting to their cars, they're loud. The more you drink, the more boisterous you are, the loud you are. Now they're on their cell phones, you know, playing their radios. The, the cars peel off because they're inebriated. There was an accident about three weeks ago, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. A patron leaves Brady's, gets into his truck, and goes down the street on um, Doan and crashes into a park sign in the middle of the day. These people are being overserved. It's an all cash business, and I think you might want to look into whether or not there's audits or actually reporting all the income. There are no receipts ever passed out at Brady's. So I'm just imploring upon you, when you are considering uh, expanding the outdoor ordinance, which again, we, we are all supportive during COVID. We wanted everybody to be able to have economic you know, uh, revenues during that difficult period of time. But it's not a one-size-fits-all. When you're looking at bars and you're looking at restaurants, please look at the particular locations. And we are in a neighborhood, predominantly neighborhood. So um, we'll be coming back. Um, we'll be working with Rebecca and Josephine. And thank you for, um, for listening. I'm going to hand out these pictures. I'd appreciate your taking a look at them. Well, thank, thank you. This is just from last week. Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate your comments and your input. Good afternoon, sir. Hi, my name's James Ewing Whitman. Maybe, maybe the timer's going to work, maybe it's not. I said this would be a short meeting. So, you know, I remember coming here on a Monday. It was kind of the end of March 2020. Picked up something, said there was going to be a live meeting. Came on Tuesday, it was raining. And it's the first time that I really saw Andy Mills, you know, really acting in an unfamiliar way. He seemed really like a panicked, frantic individual. I don't want to imitate him, but um, he seemed really panicked. That was the day of the uh, plan, plan demic, scam demic, uh, for what do you want to call it. 
So here it is, um, August 22nd, 2023, and a lot of information saying there's gonna be another lockdown coming in September. And it's like people are, the organizations are just being so transparent about what they're doing. You know, I spoke, I guess it was two weeks ago. I felt that most of the Western nations, including the United States, were in free fall. So I guess I'm just kind of here to say congratulations to all you guys for being done by six. But if some, like, supposedly serious shit hits the fan in a month or so, I'm calling bullshit on it. That's all. So thank you. Well, thank you. Do we have anyone online, Ms. Bush? On over communications? Okay. First person online, good afternoon. Yes, hello again. This is Garrett. Hey, it's very clear to me that the people who cite equity as a reason for anything are either A, what Vladimir Lenin called a useful idiot, or B, are the enemy of American culture, economics, and values. I've spoken before how the defective leftist equity concept ignores the basic realities that people are different. Potential is an abstract concept that cannot be measured or accurately predicted. So-called social determinants sure can be easily manipulated statistical correlations that don't necessarily prove any causation or possessed with any American principles. Yet leftist types apply this laughable but destructive version of social justice to everything, which are then easily hijacked to unjustly discriminate or worse. Equity is a far-left concept of the woke that is at the core of the cultural Marxism threat that seeks a state-empowered or Mao-like cultural revolution using adoptive and inflated American grievances that is slowly destroying poor, highly successful American values, culture, history, and economics. Marx sought to level economic disparity by destroying private property with a totalitarian state, doing redistribution of those shares equally. Well, you hope anyway. Cultural Marxism secretly similarly seeks to destroy any part of property or culture deemed by the woke as in any way a personal possession they assign a superiority to or having a higher status or even an average or normal status compared to other cultural systems and group identities. This is the woke universal goal, undertaking the grievance-mongering destruction of every bit of any far-left perceived difference by which they always view as oppression or injustice. Whether it is destroying natural maleness, natural womanhood, and their very successful synergistic unity, to denying natural differences, destroying the cultural norm of the heterosexual nuclear family, critical race theory, all the rest of the very successful Western Judeo-Christian culture, and making all history into an oppression, no matter how normal for the times those past events were, it all results in cultural destruction. Equity is an American cultural, equity is an American cultural and economic poison that continues to rot the city charter. You will be on the wrong side of history. Thank you very much, sir. Anyone else online? Last person online. Good afternoon. Community members, police Man. are continuing to remove homeless communities through force and threats of force. They're driving them around the city night after night. So shelter accommodations are not available for the majority of those folks. Those outside struggle to survive while the city spends taxpayer dollars to make conditions as wretched as possible for those sheltering themselves. Denied are the right to rest, to sleep, and that is to live. Now, are these unlawful sweeps and seizures now Santa Cruz Police Department official policy or unofficial? Are these threats and confiscations the new norm? Leave your survival gear or go to jail, goon squad police policy reported by those outside at the library. That's the main library on Thursday, the 17th. And then again the next morning near the tannery. Demands to leave without notice or offer of alternate shelter followed similar citations and arrests in the upper Poganip some weeks back in violation of court orders. Witnesses to the tannery raid report seeing new tents slashed and no provision made to store homeless property in police chief Escalante's how do we make them more uncomfortable policy? Are we facing our own version of the Antioch and Pittsburgh conspiracy to injure, corrupt, oppress, and intimidate as is being charged against that police department. I ask the community to help 
unhoused communities resist this, since the council obviously is on the other side of this equation, form a phone partnership with a homeless survivor. The shelters are full or unusable, and outdoor survival is the straightforward issue and a basic human rights issue. Paul Huff, Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom, at 423-4833 if you want to help out. Thank you, sir. Anyone else, Ms. Bush? For the business to come before the council, seeing hearing none, a motion to adjourn no, would be, one, say it again. I have one thing to add from the last one. Please. Uh, there was a, a member of the public, and I just wanted to um, share that the outdoor dining private property permanent program is in process and um, there will be community meetings with neighbors um, around areas of outdoor dining on private property across the city and so those meetings with the neighbors and meetings with all of those businesses I think there's 20 currently with temporary permits but kind of moving to permanent program. So stay tuned. Um, that neighbor, um, thank you for sharing uh, the information she wanted to share, but I wanted to share for others who might also have more to say or want to give input that we will be reaching out. There is a subcommittee that will be holding meetings with neighbors so that we can um, really craft a, um, a program, a permanent program. The public property program is already done, the parklet program. Now we're working on private property outdoor dining. Um, so thank you. Thank you, council member. Motion to adjourn be in order. Ms. Brown moves, Ooh. vice mayor seconds. <laughs> Gotta be fast. Non-debatable, those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed, oh, motion carries. Aye. Ordered, we stand adjourned. Thank you.